Okay, this meeting is being recorded. That's good to hear. Um, and then, um, uh, Abe, can you uh, introduce yourself? Yes, uh, thanks for organizing. Um, so my name is Abe Hendricks. I'm also a PhD candidate, um, but I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Groningen and uh, Ghent University in Belgium. Uh, my research really focuses on the uh, imaginaries in rural areas in, in Europe uh, of the circular economy. Um, and I try to, to kind of juxtapose those imaginaries with national policies. So how far do those um, you know, regional imaginaries go along with national policies when it comes to the circular economy? Wonderful. And I will introduce myself very briefly as well. Um, for those of you who are only passingly familiar with me, maybe. So uh, I'm Joost. I'm an associate professor at the Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development, focusing on foresight and anticipatory governance. And I um, have been working for a long time on using futures for policy guidance all around the world in the context of climate and food and agriculture. Um, but uh, as time went on, focusing more and more on the politics of futures and also in recent years, focusing on games as a tool to explore different futures. And in that context of games and creative practices, I'm now exploring together with a bunch of uh, other colleagues, um, sort of the role of these types of this type of media in um, engaging with uh, shared imaginaries as well. So my interest is moving towards this sort of social imaginary space too. Um, yeah, so that's me. I have uh, just I have a few uh, slides that I can share just to get us started, but it's going to be a, a very open uh, conversation with a few questions on it. Uh, so let me just uh, let me just share. Uh, so that's visible, I think. Yes. Good. Okay, good. So imaginaries, uh, social imaginaries and various varieties of this term have been around for some time. And here's a few of the books, for instance, by Benedict Anderson, who talks about imagined communities and sort of nation states, uh, work by Charles Taylor on social imaginaries and very, very influentially um, Sheila Jasanoff and uh, Sang Yung Kim, who talk about um, socio-technical imaginaries. Uh, there's lots of definitions of these various ideas. Uh, of these terms, I can um, especially recommend a paper by Manjana Milkoreit. And Manjana was actually in the meeting uh, earlier today, but she couldn't be here for this session, unfortunately. But Manjana has written a wonderful paper um, for the con that's relevant for the context of climate change called Imaginary Politics, Climate Change and Making the Future. Uh, it's published in 2017 in Elementa. And Manjana offers a her definition of what she calls um, socioclimactic uh, imaginaries or social imaginary ima uh, and social environmental imaginaries, uh, which she describes as collectively held visions of the future, which comes from Jasanov and Kim, um, that include the natural environment informed by climate change science, po possibly even as an agent rather than as a mere object or context, and that they are informed by beliefs about patterns and pathways of environmental and social change, including political, economic, and technological change, paying attention to the complex interactions between natural and social systems over time, and can include desirable, undesirable, and mixed visions of possible futures. Now, there's a lot to unpack here. And uh, I, I would say that we just launch into it. Uh, there's lots of interesting things here. One thing that I wanna mention from Manjana's paper about imaginaries is that um, one difference, for instance, between her definition here, which is quite elaborate for social climactic or social environmental imaginaries, is that she considers it very important not just to look at desired futures, but to look at any futures, right? And, and any collectively held, institutionally embedded, um, you know, politically supported, etc. ideas of the future, whether desirable, undesirable, mixed, otherwise, um, utopian, dystopian, etc., would be important here. Um, and uh, and just to sort of uh, frame things a little bit more, uh, the Jasanov and Kim for focus is on future imaginaries, but there is important. There are important reasons to open it up more to more general social imaginaries and consider pasts, different presents and present imaginaries um, uh, uh, there as well in, into this sort of like investigation. What I would like to do, and I will, uh, I will drop these questions in the chat in a minute so we can see each other's faces again and just have an open conversation, is to uh, dive into these different questions, ask each of the uh, participants to comment on it, to think about it a little bit, and then uh, and then open it up uh, to see what other people in the audience think as well. 
So the three questions are, they're very basic questions. Uh, what do you find to be the most useful framing of imaginaries? Or if you prefer, how, would, how do you like to work with imaginaries? Or maybe you, you hate the whole concept and you have something to say about that. Uh, <laughs> Abed's laughing already, I see. Um, and, um, given, given that kind of framing, how do we actually know we are expanding imaginaries or in, otherwise changing or engaging with imaginaries? And what does that mean? And then finally, so what? So what, what, what is the, what's the role of social imaginaries and larger change processes? Obviously, you can tell that these questions are coming from a slightly transformative, activistic attitude where I'm like, let's do something with this, right? What can we do with, with social imaginaries? Uh, in whatever in whatever form uh, but let's uh, yeah let's talk about it so i will stop sharing my screen and i will drop these questions in the chat and then let's see what everyone has to say and i will give whoever of the three panelists feels the most ready to uh, to speak up and uh, and we can we can take it from there and we'll just have an open conversation and everyone in the chat everyone uh, online here uh, feel free to to add your comments as well, and we can open it up. So, uh, so what what? How do you engage with imaginaries, uh, with the social imaginaries? Uh, what do you find to to be the most useful way to think about them? Framing, I find a little bit theoretical to just talk about framing, but how do you usually usefully think about imaginaries? Anyone, Abe, Lisette, or Martin, want to speak to this question? Uh, yeah, I could I could start. Go uh, ahead. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so I think that the, the definition you gave from uh, from Montana Mukherjee is really uh, really useful uh, already. Um, it's also obviously, or she, she developed it from kind of like standing on the shoulders of the the previous uh, definitions. Um, and personally, what I find most interesting on on using or how to use imaginaries is um, kind of in between a lot of different categories we're used to to analyze. So in between the focus on individuals and the collective, uh, focusing so not merely on something that's like state policy, but also not that's just one actor, one actor organization, but somewhere somewhere in between uh, that kind of level of analysis, if you can call it like that. Um, but I also immediately on, 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 on top of that, it's kind of like a combination of, of, of values of social ideas, as well with the combination of practices, I think, for me, and that's something really important compared to a lot of related uh, topics. I think that imaginaries is something more than just being descriptive, but they also are very, very much performative in a sense that when you talk about these visions of the future whether, uh, or of the past or the present, I'm happy to engage in that later. But if you focus on those those visions, that they also do more than just being saying something about it, but that they are uh, yeah, kind of like uh, yeah, create things and maybe to give an example and a very concrete example on that is that these kind of collectively held visions uh, then lead to say um, infrastructure or say, say like financing programs or kind of like things that are on one hand tangible but also yeah fed, fed into uh, by more uh, more abstract things Thanks, uh, but that's a really useful uh, way to, to describe the value right as a sort of boundary, concept that connects lots of different ostensibly more concrete things uh really wonderful yeah lisette i see you are muted you want to go next yeah i just unmuted because i think i can um, follow up on this uh, very neatly um so just like uh, Ab, i'm also interested in it be of, because of the performative effect so imaginary you're not just out there but do something uh in the world so i'm i'm personally studying this in the context of global modeling and certain um, fishes that are in models, uh, described in models, uh, can become uh, political realities um, because they become persuasive. Uh, so this is how we use it. And I didn't realize actually, Jo, that you were going to um, explain Manana's uh, <laughs> um, concept, but I think it's really useful because I, I wanted to bring this up as well, actually myself, um, because what I think is important in imaginaries, what is also missing from um, Jasanov and Kim is that it's sometimes also an unconscious uh, thing or an, not necessarily a deliberate thing. Um, so not just putting fishes out there with a certain purpose, but sometimes it's kind of also 
be less purposeful and still very uh, influential. Uh, so that's, that's something uh, to be brought up. And a problem that I think I'm always uh, struggling with with imagine, imaginaries is when is something collectively shared? And I'm also, um, yeah. yeah, this I think it's, it makes them, yeah, it's just a problem. And also the difference with discourses, which maybe uh, Martin could uh, follow up on. Thanks. Wonderful. That's a nice. Uh, that's a nice um, transition to Martin there, Lisette. And I, uh, I really agree. I think this is a really important point about imaginaries not being so intentional or purposeful, right? And then it, it can also be um, these sort of in, unintentional imaginaries can can intentionally be mobilized by others, right? So that's also an interesting thing. Uh, Martin, you want to go? You want to go next? You have any thoughts? And do you have a follow up to Lisette's uh, proposal for you to talk about imaginaries and discourses? Yeah, um, well, my area of research um, is definitely more linked to um, discourse analysis per se, right? But discourse analysis, what is that anyways, right? Uh, it's the analysis of expressed uh, human thought uh, or human expression in any form. Uh, might that be spoken, written, artistic, you know, interpretive dance or whatever. Um, and obviously an imaginary is one form of expressing, uh, or rather one way, one form of discourse is, is expressing in an imaginary. Uh, so I see imaginaries as a subset of uh, what we analyze in, in, in the broad discourse analysis uh, field. Um, and uh, what I'm particularly interested in regards to imaginaries um, is that I think what, as, as Latouche, Serge Latouche, uh, important sociologist put it, is we must decolonize the imaginaries. Uh, or as Escobar put it, we must think about pluriversal imaginaries uh, to create um, multiple ways of world making. Uh, and what I mean by that is that right now our imaginary systems are um, not so free as we wish. Uh, they are based on power structures and uh, who controls different medias and different school systems and different institutions that determine what is uh, information people can get and what kind of thinking we can have about what a future can or might not look like. And right now we have been pretty much uh, under 40 years of, um, or even more actually, uh, I mean, every in moment in time, there is a dominant imaginary. Right now, it's the neoliberal uh, and eco-modernist imaginary that pretty much dominates our think thinking about an ecological future. Um, and, and that's where we must decolonize in order to understand that there are many plural other forms of world making and imagining the future, such as those of indigenous peoples in the global south, of Taoist and Confucian thinking from Asia, uh, of Buddhism uh, as well, that has constructed very, very interesting forms of imagining an ecologically sound future and, and uh, multiple more. I mean, there's just a plurality of different forms of imagining that are, are not um, are not shared, as you said, Lisa. There's a problem of what is being shared. Well, right now what's being shared is what's the dominant what 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 don't what hegemonic discourse dictates in a sense and 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 that's for me that's the big problem like the framing is limited and and we must we must learn to think beyond uh the the or there is no alternative kind of idea that we it's easier for us to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism yet if we want to live in a prosperous and sustainable future in which humanity and and, and planet earth might actually strive and uh if we actually even just want to have a planet to be honest we, we have to think about living beyond uh, a system that is dependent upon growth and therefore beyond capitalism and and i think uh yeah that that requires a decolonization of what we thought and, and we thought we knew before yeah thanks wonderful there's so much to pick up there martin that i think also lisette and abe want to might want to jump on i'll give you guys a moment do you want to uh, do you want to quickly respond to any any these of these notions of decolonizing imaginaries and Escobar's pluriverse and pluralism, world making, anything there that you want to maybe react to? Abe, I see your, go ahead. 
Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so I think that that's completely, uh, completely right. And maybe to give an example with what we've been talking about earlier today is that the way we think, uh, and also the, something that Manjana McGrath uh, touches upon, is the way we think about time and the way we understand the temporality and the way we, uh, we understand that. And I think Gregia, uh, in her presentation earlier, really um, also opened up the debate of like, is this like kind of a category maybe within imaginaries that's very stiff dealt with as an analytical entity, but also, on the other hand, the way we think it within the imaginary of time, temporality, and these elements. Um, and I think those, you see, when you see kind of like clashes around those kind of categories, whether time is to be understood as a linear or whether, for example, time is thought of in four-year policy cycles or whether in terms of ancestry or, or generations, um, you already see kind of like clashes at the, at the boundaries of the thinkable uh, so to say where I hope that that's contributing, uh, highlighting those things, contributing to uh, to deconstructing those uh, those boundaries and in a maybe a couple of, couple of uh, steps later also uh, contributing to decolonizing. Hmm. Thanks, Albert. What about you, Lisa? Do you have any uh, any uh, reactions to these sort of notions of decolonizing, pluralization, different imaginaries, um, assessing their own uh you know truth and the one world world as as, as Garar would call it right any any thoughts about that yeah um so yeah i obviously agree with uh, the notion of uh the pluriverse and having plural uh, futures something that i um yeah uh, which you also touched upon martin is the the existing power structures and how existing uh, dominant imaginaries are also actively enacted the whole time and so there's something uh, difficult to be um, to imagine different possible futures doesn't maybe necessarily mean that the dominant one is is um, replaced or something. So maybe that also touches upon your the second question of today, like how if we are actually expanding imaginaries, but does it really change uh, the ones that are dominant kind of? That's a really that's a really interesting point, right? So uh, it relates to um, I see that there is a question um, that I maybe just want uh, Rob to give uh, some space for because I think it just connects perfectly with what Lisette what you just said, which is about right because Lisette I think your provocation would be are we merely interested in expanding imaginaries or are we also interested in maybe uh, destabilizing existing ones, right? And so Rob, mm -hmm. I don't know if you if you want to. Uh, you want to follow up on that? Uh, uh, yeah, sh yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you, Just and, and thanks everyone for your reflection so far. Just in, in terms of questioning and probing the, the, the concept of imaginaries at, at, at its root, uh, Martin uh, and everyone is 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 it a, is it a concept that's that's fundamentally based in a in a in a in a dualism of the of the imagined and and, and the real that perhaps doesn't necessarily conflate with the with the with the to borrow a term from Jonathan Lee, the cosmopolitics of 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 post-colonial or, 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 or kind of communities, indigenous communities that would be looked to decolonizing the term and would be look, looking to create these pluriversal futures is the, is the idea of an imaginary rooted in, in, a, in a sort of an intentionality, uh, an agency that it is something in itself that needs to be decolonized or, or is it something that, 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 that we, is broad enough to, to be given enough uh, analytical space to, to do what we want it to do or to do what we want other people to do. Well, not that we want other people to do but you know is it is it is it supple enough or is it, yes. or, is it or is it rooted in something that is a bit more very good question yeah that's a very good question rob i think uh, uh i wonder if uh if uh, this the panelists would like to speak to that is the notion of imaginary itself something that needs to be decolonized as a as a, a division between the ima the collectively imagined and the real we're going deep. Thanks, Rob. That's good. Any any thoughts? Uh, Martin, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if anything has to not be decolonized, to be honest. I, I mean, imaginaries is, is an obvious part of what needs to be decolonized, but everything we've been taught to think and we think has been structured uh, according to certain institutional and hegemonic forms of, of of world making that obviously um you know limit our, our freedom and our ability to to imagine you know a different world 
and uh, and obviously, therefore, everything uh, from the everything in the world of discourse, and even in the way that we do architecture, and the way we do cities, and the way we we think about climate modeling, or in the way that you know even we build a bridge, you know, we have to decolonize what we've been taught so that we might be able to imagine beyond those uh, usual parameters, uh, and 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 kind of really open up our ability to be creative as human beings and as free human beings rather than just institutionally created machines, you know, that, that are efficient and good at replicating capital, you know, and, and appropriating commons, you know, that's, you know, so it's everything has to be decolonized, obviously. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Martin. Yeah, good point. Uh, Abby, you want to follow up? Uh... Yeah, so, so maybe on, on the distinction between the imagined and the real um, is, is that I, I think that that's um in in the literature also already for debate quite a lot like where does one start and where does one end and is it like kind of dualistic thinking between those two is that is that uh, appropriate um but what i think that the way i tend to use or i want to use the idea of imaginaries goes indeed like on link those two so these visions that are held and maybe not or most of the time not even made explicit that we have them and that we share them um but we act upon them um, so that's exactly like kind of this where it becomes real and where it becomes turned into something um, that is tangible and also the outcomes of that could be seen as something to be decolonized. And I think on, in that realm, it's, it's, it's a very useful analytical tool. Um, but on your notion of like intentionality, I think that's also where Lizette started off with, is to focus on that that's maybe a critique on, on Jessenov and Kim's work to, to maybe go beyond that or maybe to, to get also to the passive side of uh, of imaginaries. Nice, and so uh, and so, Abe. The um, as just to sort of like reflect on that, the the notion that the term imaginaries can in fact be used to bridge the, that dualism and uh, and show how these things are, are very enmeshed, right? Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, Lisette, um, you are working on some some dominant sort sort of like some some ways in which science contributes to global imaginaries. Around uh, around modeling and and integrated assessment, uh, what do you feel, if you take your own sort of uh, provocation there about maybe destabilizing existing imaginaries? How would you say that is relevant to sort of global modeling? Can you talk to us about that? I'm very curious. Yeah, sure. So um, in global models, you could actually say that they are kind of reiterating um, dominant uh, imaginaries, for instance, of continued uh, growth. So um, and something that um, I'm, I was studying uh, before was uh, about how specific ideas from models become um, can kind of become powerful beyond their uh, intention and beyond their sphere. So, for instance, um, uh, looking at the climate projections uh, of the 1.5 degree report, saying, for instance, um, we need a specific amount of emissions reduction by 2030. And suddenly um, this kind of narrative became boosted in popular media as something like we have 12 years to uh, save climate change. So that's, this is something, um, it's not maybe not really an imaginary, but I, I think it's really interesting to follow how uh, specific visions can be gain tra uh, tra traction beyond their, their own practice. Um, and on the topic of um, uh, reiter reiter reiterating um, dominant uh, imaginaries. I think it's uh, really interesting also to see that uh, global modelers try to always refer to themselves as uh, map makers. So they, they kind of uh, make a map of how the future uh, may look like. And then the uh, policymakers are their navigators that can use the map to uh, make decisions. But actually, um, so their, their whole uh, idea of what is on this map is actually very much uh, influenced by uh, dominant uh, imaginaries. So um, how to break out of that? Um, I'm yeah, I'm looking at how to use modeling in combination with other um, futuring techniques, uh, but I'm not that far yet. But uh, yeah, this is something to do two of the things that I'm thinking about in that context. And so that, that might mean that one of the things that needs to happen is that people who are involved in doing this sort of authoritative modeling work uh, might might need to learn more about, you know, become more reflexive about 
social imaginaries and how they and their own positionality with regards to this sort of dominant imaginaries right i think he said yeah yeah exactly yeah 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 wonderful um excellent what about uh, i'm just going to ask one more question and then open it up uh, uh but just quickly from each of the three of you um we we've talked mostly about sort of decolonizing and destabilizing dominant imaginaries what about extending imaginaries or creating new imaginaries uh maybe entirely new you know hybrid imaginaries if we think about that sort of pluriverse and world making um obviously there is a plurality of existing imaginaries but how do we think about um sort of the, the you know, the creation the emergence etc of new imaginaries and how that could be um how that could be sort of politically and materially relevant let's say in terms of real impacts can i maybe ask abe uh to speak to that i see you frowning the most so i'm making life difficult by asking you first but yeah um so 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 how i what, what i see is that maybe it's 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 very much related to the idea of like this hegemonic imaginary or this, this this discourse that's very central is that um, I think it, it's kind of like how I see this at, at the boundaries of this um, this this imaginary there's kind of like on the one hand the kind of the, the notion of expanding so there's the same uh, imaginary getting expanded to multiple places but also seeing there like kind of like matters of of, of yeah, battles of translation or um, so you see, it, it's I find it a bit hard to 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 phrase that in a in a very very nice way, but I have the feeling that exactly on where people are not very clear about what they mean when they talk, for example, in my case about the circular economy, was a very uh, abstract concept quite often. Um, that I have the feeling that that's exactly where these different um, imaginaries are to some extent present. And maybe maybe to to, to add on that, or maybe to, to to reflect on that, is that you see that over time for some kind of big actors, main actors, as such as the European Union, um, hijack the discourse and hijack the imaginary and kind of occupy all the other spaces and um, leave no room for other imaginaries. But I have the feeling that when a new concept comes up, there's a lot of talk about different things. Uh, degrowth very much at the core of the circular economy for a while. Sometimes, for example, one of the things Martin wrote, but quite most 95, 98% of the time, there's nothing about it. And I think you see it pushed out of the, the potential of the imaginary, but there is constantly this battle going on. And I have the feeling, and maybe it's a hope more than a feeling, uh, that when that comes over and over again, that, that sometime, at some point will we'll stick. Uh, and that this extension or expansion um, yeah, will change in another type of process. Thanks, uh, Ab. Really nice thoughts there. Um, maybe Lisette or Martin, do you want to respond to the idea of extending or even creating new or sort of hybrid imaginaries from existing ones? Any thoughts about this, this more generative side of the conversation? Go ahead, Martin. Um, what I was uh, thinking on is, um, or at least the way that I see a really important space for the creation of imaginaries that are plural um, in the way that Escobar means it and um, a lot of post-development thinkers and, and post-growth thinkers mean it as well mm. is uh, creating a democratic space, right? Like a truly democratic space where power is shared equally. And within the field of deliberative democracy specifically, um, there's been a lot of research on how to create these deliberative spaces, notably through random selection of citizens in the country, like the mm. creation of randomly selected assemblies of 150 people that are brought to deliberate on a certain topic for a, couple, a certain number of months and then produce a report that actually leads to different changes in policy. Mm. Um, the creation of such assemblies is actually one of the demands of Extinction Rebellion and uh, was actually also done in France mm. uh, following the Gilets Jaunes protests and uh, leading to a selection of 150 randomly selected uh, French citizens that represent a representative sample of the French population. They are then uh, brought uh, in lectures with a lot of a plurality of different views, plur plurality sorry, of different uh, academics and perspectives on the topic of climate change and can deliberate and really openly talk about it. And I think that's where real imaginaries can be created in a space that is that is really empowering and free and, and where every citizen can voice his opinion without feeling uh you know 
or, or being told what to do. And, and I don't think it's for academics perhaps to do it, but rather for, for citizens to co-create it. Or they, mm-hmm. they can be part of the process by teaching them some of the, you know, basics of what's going on with the, the climate change or with different types of, 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 of thinking from indigenous peoples or from other philosophies and etc. But then who actually has to um, create the visions, I think, are, are, are people because they're the ones that will have to live in the future that will be imagined there. Uh, you know, as Abby rightly said, you know, imaginaries have a real concrete impact. You know, once you choose how the bridge is built, the bridge will be built. Or once you choose how the city is, the city will be built. You know, whether you have bicycles or tons of highways, that will impact the reality of our lives and that will make who we are in the future as well. So yeah. Essentially, the only people that have the legitimacy to make our own future are other people, are our citizens. And the only right. way in a society where there's millions of us is to have a random selection. And and so, of course, there, there, there could be a role for scientists not only to sort of bring in the climate science and everything like that, but also to bring in uh, some, you know, to uh, again help with some reflexivity about the, the impact of uh, connecting to certain imaginaries and not to others, right? Um, exactly. You said, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Uh, Lisette, what uh, what do you think about this uh, notion of expanding imaginaries, creating new imaginaries, imaginaries emerging from from hybrids of other ones? Yeah. Any thoughts? Yeah, thank you. So um, actually, I was really happy that Martin brought up this uh, liberative democracy because I'm also uh, engaging with this in my uh, research, and I think it's really interesting because the, um, the role of science really becomes an issue here. For instance, with the France. Um, uh, example, then um, scientists actually had a very kind of directive role in in um, proposing alternatives. So mm-hmm. I'm really wondering how how really engaging with the future could be uh, something embedded in there because I think it's it's still mostly uh, considering consisting um, existing alternatives, um, for instance, with climate policy, and not really focus on how do we actually imagine a, a radically different future and how do we create the processes to do that yeah. so i'm yeah i would be interested in um, looking at what can futuring kind of do beyond the the ways in in, in which you know um liberative democracy is currently practiced Wonderful. Yeah, political empowerment, sort of democratically uh, organized political empowerment around new imaginaries. Yeah, really nice. Uh, I, th- I think there's there's lots to explore here, uh, for sure. So I, I so we have a little bit of time left, and I and there's a few questions uh, or comments here, um, and I wonder. So I see Dave. Who, who uh, Dave? Do you want to quickly speak up if you can keep it a bit a bit tight? Uh, just to add your comment there. I don't know if Dave's still here. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, sure. So I was just wondering about the idea of imaginary itself, if that's more of a lens into the current time frame and the current dominant ideologies, than that it is something that we place into the future. Yeah, interesting question. So uh, do we, ima- yeah, in a way, I think imaginaries as socially sort of enacted and uh, reinforced um, spaces of collective imagination are very much part of the present, right? They are, they are, they are, play, they are acting on on the present and they're acting on politics and action. Um, I wonder if uh, if anyone and you know I would open it up to the audience if anyone else from the audience has any thoughts about this uh, point that the, that imaginaries are very much part of the fabric of current action and experience. Um, and you know the, the the panelists or anyone else want to speak to that this point briefly. People are thinking. No. Yeah, maybe Go. maybe to just uh, yes. to just uh, briefly answer is that I definitely think that it's kind of like a, a constant renegotiation of. The present and, and and the future so the what you wrote in the chat on, on the assemblage i think it's really that the these imaginaries are in that sense uh a non-cohesive set of like uh of ideas where and where is enacted upon and also these assemblage that it's open within the thinkable so it's kind of like it's not fully open-ended and that makes it kind of interesting is that they don't they're not rigid but they're, because they're def, they're def, they are not rigid but 
they are also not too easy to change because otherwise it would be imaginaries. It's a very interesting, uh, yeah, very interesting area of how that that those practices uh, unfold. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thanks, Abe. Um, there is there are two there are two comments and, uh, that are related to each other. I think uh, Nicolas says, "How do we bridge between work with imaginaries and work with practical decision making and policy making? How can quantitative models and uh, imaginaries inform each other?" Thinking about Lisette's work. Inter interested in the interface between these two aspects. And then Aaron says, super interested in the effective emotive responses that imaginaries provoke and how those at different social political organization or how those work at different social political organizational layers. So how does the panel address the role of political effect within imaginaries or futures? So I would I would want to raise those two questions. Uh, so one is more focused on interactions between imaginaries and decision making, and the other one on the sort of emotional you know the em emotional aspect and, poli and political affect within imaginaries of futures i wonder if any any one of the panelists or maybe any, someone else has any reactions to this you can pick you can pick your question go ahead and uh, martin oh, oh yeah go ahead martin. sorry go, sorry. go ahead Lisa. You, you, you can go first. Yeah, go, go, Lisa, and then Martin right. will go next. It always happens. Um, so maybe I can just go on uh, answering the first because it's always also a bit more related to what I'm doing. So, um, yeah. yeah, I think with Im imaginaries, I think it's really important to look at the specific um, practices through which imaginaries uh, kind of resonate. Because, for instance, uh, with quantitative models, like this idea of um, knowledge about the future being quantitative uh, and be becoming uh, powerful is it's really something becoming powerful in a specific context of um, global policy making for instance and not necessarily maybe uh, in a different context so which kind of visions of the future become powerful or become collectively shared in which i think we need to um, look at different uh, practices of decision making uh, because it's not uh, um, a similar process. Um, I hope I answer your question a little bit by this. Hmm. Thanks, Lisa. And Martin, you want to follow up? Uh... Uh, I mean, I was basically going to say something very similar to what Lisa said. So, yeah, hmm. essentially, w what matters is what basically what imagine what discourses or what ideas policymakers even decide to 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 acknowledge and, and to take into their understanding in order to make policies for example like our degrowth visions there are when vivir visions there are you know um eco-socialist visions there or more eco-modernist visions there and anyways that that matters right so that they, the, the policies are based on a theoretical understanding of the world and, and in, depending on which one they choose then you you have the policies that reflect that right in any case it also as Lizette said depends on how you decide to make those policies and the process this can be more or less democratic and more or less plural and that will affect the outcomes obviously yeah thanks martin nice nice comments both and Lisa, do you want to add to that it's yeah, I'm just gonna maybe just gonna say that this is really a continuous process between. Well, in my work, I'm focusing also on the science policy dynamics, and it's a continuous process between the two. Um, so, for imaginaries starting to change, it takes a long time because, for instance, scientists they want to be policy relevant, so they think about um, they might be a bit hesitant to come up with really radical um, uh, storylines or narratives, for instance. So now for the first time, I think uh, global modeling has um, <clears throat> looked at the growth scenarios, whereas this, um, this course has been around for uh, quite a few years now, for instance. So it's really, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was really good to see, <coughs> a better, late, better late than never, <laughs> I guess. Uh, but, but very interesting to see that work being incorporated. Um, yeah, so uh, I see a question from Rachel. And there's lots of questions actually it's a very lively chat uh, but we can't address them all we have a few minutes left before the end of this session um uh, rachel do you want to uh, do you want to express your question by voice if not i can also ask it uh so um and just interrupt me if you're there <laughs> Rachel's asking, what about design fiction as a methodology for engaging policymakers with imaginaries, right? And I think I think it connects to the point about 
the role of futures that uh, uh, that Lisette has mentioned, and that I think that uh, Abe and Martin also agree with that sort of the role of using futures in these sort of deliberate spaces, but also with the ma policymakers, uh, is going to be is going to be very useful. Uh, so maybe just to move on, if Rachel isn't here, um, uh, th this all connects, right? So uh, uh, Vitalia, I don't know if you're uh, if you're there, uh, but um, that's it. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Yeah, my question is um, how we as a scientist can also participate actively in uh, producing these new imaginaries, but really not like experts, but as citizens, because we now a little bit at some point we talked like we don't belong to the society, but we also are citizens. We have families. Now we have children. We think of the future and yeah, how how do we put ourselves in service in this way? Not as experts, but as simple humans. Thanks. Yeah. Does anyone want to jump on that uh, on that question? Thanks a lot. Well, maybe to maybe to uh, so the question that was raised before was was around like when uh, does it become collective? And I think that there's a lot of, a lot of debates, but I think just making the vision or the ideas you have on a citizen level, uh, kind of like as collective as possible and, and acting upon that. So not only, uh, spreading the word, but also really doing or preaching, uh, or like, uh, practicing what you preach. I think that's, that's the most important thing what we can do, uh, to expand it. Um, and this is a bit, I, I don't want to, uh, repeat myself, but it's kind of also like being reflective on the kind of layer below um, what is articulated. Just the kind of taken for granted assumptions. It's like challenging that within uh, collectives. I think that's the most important thing to get people starting to think in a similar direction as you do. Um, but that's just, yeah, I would say that like, it's very hard to get outside of the existing political and social structures. So I yeah. think to a certain extent, you need to use them to break out. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm I'm going to uh, just m mention one more question, and I, I would like Lisette, Martin, and Abed to all respond to it, or maybe just Lisette and Martin's Abed just spoke, just to make it a bit balanced. But uh, Miranda, do you want to express your question? Are you able to speak up? I saw that Rachel that you weren't able to speak before, so apologies for pretending you weren't there or something. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. Miranda. Oh, I think I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, yes. no. So I mean, I'm a discourse analyst and I find that the idea of socio-technical imaginaries, imaginaries, there's a lot of overlap there between sort of a lot of the concepts that we use in, in discourse analysis. Um, so I was just interested. Um, so this is a question that I deal with from my perspective, but um yeah, the the role of structure versus agency and change in expanding social imaginaries. So if we assume, which it seems that a lot of us here do, that all imaginaries are bound and shaped by existing dominant discourses that limit what it's possible to think, imagine, enact, um, do individuals or groups really have the power to step beyond these existing structures? Um, and even if they do, they're able to create novel social imaginaries, break outside of these structural boxes in which we think. Um, can these really be performatively powerful in a world already structured by dominant discourses slash imaginaries? Nice, uh, nice question. Structure versus agency. Um, Lisette or Martin, you, Lisette, go ahead. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's a kind of a million dollar question, but I think, um, yeah, so Recently, uh, uh, me and Aben in our book, we read the uh, Aryan Abidrai's work on capacity to, to aspire. And I see him laughing because maybe he's also thinking about that. But I think it's really something um, valuable to read if you're interested in this, because he really um, describes like local uh, indigenous communities having the capacity to aspire and this uh, collective um, capacity to actually um, imagine different futures and also change kind of dominant um, uh, institutional structures in uh, their countries. So uh, maybe a hope, more hopeful thing is that um, I think that yeah, this this capacity to aspire and hope is something that we um, should em empower. And maybe it's also maybe to to reflect a bit on the first question as a scientist. Maybe we, we should also have a role in empowering 
um, people to um, imagine different futures. Wonderful, thanks, uh, Lisette. Uh, nice, nice reference there to uh, other guys work. Um, and Martin, do you want to speak to this question? Um, yeah, I think Lisette said said it really nicely. Uh, I mean, I think as scientists, we have a role to kind of be active anyways, right? Because we're citizens too. And, 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 and if we can't be active in a way that empowers those that are that have less of a voice, because institutionally, because we've decided to segre segregate people based on how much education they've had, uh, we apparently have a bit more education. Uh, whether that makes us wiser is a different thing, but uh, at least we should, through that privilege at least, try to empower those that have less of it. Uh, and, and I think that's important. Uh, in any case, uh, yeah, whether structure agency matters more. I, I mean, there, there is no doubt that in a system where the means of production and the means of communication are owned privately and by a handful of people, as we know, uh, there is less opportunities for those that don't have those means of production and of communication to have a voice and to share that voice, to have it spread. And, 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 and that's where there's an important need for community media sources and community ways of, of sharing information uh, to, to, to be more widespread, such as community radios, community newspapers, and et cetera. And, and those should be supported um, and, in order to, to kind of just build further capacity for imagining beyond uh, the, the, the traditional hegemonic uh, worldview. And, and, and there is a lot of people, there are a lot of people that are trying to shout uh, alternative propositions, uh, including in the global south. Um, and unfortunately, their voices are, are, are not always heard. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of hard when you're, when you're dealing. I mean, yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I'm, I think that at the end, structure has more power, but, but we have, I, I think at the end, we have the numbers behind. So in any case, we have to organize better because otherwise we're not going to get hurt very well. Thanks, Martin. Actually, uh, this is a really nice segue into the next uh, conversation uh, on the on the uh, the project uh, on the on the program here, uh, which is about uh, uh, sort of a difficulty. This is about difficulties encountered as a non-white and non-male person in academia. So I just thought it would be. It's a right. I think it's the right time to transition, and I'll, so I'll hand back over to Sarah in a moment. I just want to say uh, thanks, everyone. For uh, thanks, panelists. You are amazing people, and uh, I really appreciate your your intelligent and uh, insightful uh, and engaged comments. Thanks, everyone in the audience as well. I think this is a really exciting conversation where lots of work. Uh, lots of work is coming together that is really cutting edge, I think, for all of us and a space that we all. So I, I'm really looking forward to continuing the conversation as a participant also tomorrow. Uh, so uh, with that, I would like to hand back over to you, Sarah. And, uh, and yeah, and thanks again, everyone. Really wonderful that everyone's here. This is great. Yeah, uh, thank you so much as well, everyone, uh, for the panel discussion. Uh, it was very nice to uh, listen in and just lay back um, and uh, yeah, Umar, I also see you still have your hand up. I'm very sorry we couldn't address uh, your question or comment. If you want, you can still put it in the conference channel in the thread for the panel discussion. Yeah, and, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, I don't see any raised hands. I think my Zoom version is outdated or something, but I don't see any raised hands. So I just uh, okay, okay, just reacted to the chat basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 